Today, I'm gonna sell this chunk of wood for as much as I possibly can. So something that I wanna do with this build is keep track of all of the costs. That way we can see what the actual profit is. And it's a little tricky with this project because there's one big variable, which is gonna be the actual slab top itself. So this is a piece that would have first come into my life a few months ago when I was on the hunt for a Claro walnut slab for a dining table. So first off, if you've never heard of GL Veneer, do yourself a favor and after this video's over, go do some online window shopping just for fun. Because if you're anything like me, you're gonna have a good time. But anyway, while I was doing that a couple months ago, I stumbled upon this slab, which was exactly what I was looking for. So the reason this is a big variable in terms of cost for the project is because the slab costs $3,300. Now I think it would be pretty reasonable to say that the cost of the wood for this top should be zero because all of the costs were sunk into that initial dining table and this is really just the off cut, but I'm not gonna do that. So instead I calculated the volume of this chunk as a percentage of the slab, which came out to a little bit less than 5%. So let's just call the cost $156.75. Now the other thing that we need to address is how I'm going to sell this piece. So what I did was, prior to building, I set up a quick website to host an auction and gave people a week in early November to submit their bids. And the way we're going to pick the winner is by taking their bid, minus shipping costs, and whatever's the highest wins. Now all I'm really doing here is trying to get the edges cleaned up while leaving them as natural looking as possible. And it's actually really surprising how much work goes into making something look like no work went into it at all. Maybe like somebody with nice bed head hair. I guess the litmus test would be if anybody ever sees the finished piece and compliments me on how well I shaped the edges, then I failed. Now, if you saw the dining table video, then you might remember that that slab had a lot of bow in it. And unfortunately, this chunk is the same. With the slab, that was fine because it started off at about three inches thick and the finished dining table only needed to be a little bit over an inch and a half. So we could remove a lot of material in the flattening process and it would still be okay. But here, since I sliced it in half, I'm starting with a lot thinner of a piece. So we don't really have that luxury. Which means we're going to have to get a little bit more experimental. Now some of the most common questions that I get in these videos are about design. And really there's two that are by far the most common. The first is, how do you come up with your designs? And I always wish I had a good answer, but it's basically just a lot of drawing and modeling. But to be more specific, what I usually do is start with a bunch of stuff that I don't like, and then eventually find something that I do and sort of just keep working on that until I'm happy. And that's actually one of the things that I like about slab projects. The top sort of gives me a box that I have to work within. So not having the ability to change the look of a design by changing the major dimensions, like length and width, in a weird way, speeds things up and I think kind of forces creativity. So that's one question. And then the other and probably more common one is what do you use to do the drawings? And the answer is procreate for the iPad. Okay, so here I'm getting set up to do the pour and you can see in this shot again, just how bowed these chunks are. And normally a really good way to mechanically flatten boards is with C channel. You might've seen me do that in a few other videos here though, I couldn't do that for a couple reasons. First is that the C channel that I normally use is too thick to even fit in this slab. I do have some thinner C channel that I could use that's not as strong. Though actually in shorter lengths it is pretty strong, so that is an option. But with any kind of C channel, the other problem is order of operations. Basically I can't possibly install it until a lot later pretty much not until I've poured the epoxy and flattened the slab at the earliest. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. I want my boards mechanically flattened before pouring, but I can't mechanically flatten them until after pouring. Actually, that might be a catch-22 problem. What I ended up doing instead was taking a gamble. I'm betting that if I brute force the slabs flat with some clamps, I can pour and it'll hold things flat enough that I can get to the point where I can mechanically flatten them later. So I mixed up a couple gallons of Total Boat's Fathom Thick Set and took a leap of faith. What bids have come in so far? So the first bid came in for a dollar. A dollar? Oh no, that was you! 
Oh, that was my <laughs> test bid. Well, then I can say the person who bid that is an idiot. But give me one of the random real bids, not me okay. test bidding a dollar. A hundred. A hundred. Dollars. Okay. 501. Uh, 1500. Where does the person live? Texas. Everything's bigger there, including the bids. Yep. So with these videos, I don't really have a schedule set in stone, but I try to get out about one project and video per month. And what I've recently realized is that starting a project four weeks before I want the video to come out is not a good idea. And that's because with this slab, I had to leave it in my form for about nine days before I felt confident taking it out and starting working on it. Now, part of that was because of the bowed wood. I wanted to give it some extra time to really cure, but mainly it's because of the weather. Prior to this, I had only done pours in the spring and summer, and I was only waiting about two days before I could take things out. All that said, the good news is everything came out really easily, except for the form itself, which almost busted a neck vein trying to get unstuck. Once I did, though, it was nothing but blue skies. All right, so at this point, I got to say I was feeling pretty optimistic about the curve in my wood. By the way, if that's something that bothers you, apparently they make pills for that. Unfortunately for me though, with slabs, there's no magical fix. And there's also a good chance that as I thin this thing out, the curve's just gonna come right back. That said, I don't really have a choice in the matter because I can't leave it like this. So after I cleaned up the edges, I took it over to my planer and slowly worked my way down to bare wood. And as you can see in this shot, after all the dust settled, I was left with about an eighth of an inch of bow. And you can also see that it barely takes any pressure to force it flat. So I think this is going to be well within the tolerance that I need to end up flat once everything's assembled. And really what I'm more worried about than bow is cupping, which is a curve that goes across the width instead of along the length. So normally this is the exact problem that people use C-channel to fix. But rather than doing that, I'm going to make some wooden inserts that I can recess into the underside, which will solve the same problem, but I think look a little nicer. And I guess I take back what I said earlier. There is a pill for that. So to cut my recesses into the bottom, I decided to use my CNC, which I honestly probably don't utilize enough. And this might sound like a weird thing to say, but I'm actually really bad at CNCing. So I don't want this to sound like I'm bragging, but with woodworking, it's pretty rare that I catastrophically mess something up. But whenever I'm using a CNC, I almost always mess something up. Here's a good example, actually. Cutting out my pill-shaped pieces, I messed up twice. Once because I started the machine in the wrong spot and was going to basically carve into thin air, and again when I realized that after cutting out the first pill, it ruined the structural integrity of the rest of the piece. Thankfully, I was able to catch both of those things before it was too late, but yeah, two mess-ups in what should have been one really simple cut. And it's not like it's the machine's fault. I'm definitely the one to blame. But I guess, I don't know, CNC's just aren't this magical machine where you push a button and a piece of furniture pops out like people think. It's a skill just like anything else. And yeah, it's related to woodworking, but not that close. So I just want to say to all the CNC operators out there doing awesome work while their machine gets all the credit, I see you and I value you. 2000. Oh, now I'm getting so. Where's that person live? Colorado. Is his name? Yes. Who is he? Do you know him? I think I'm psychic. 301.48. Honestly, if the winning bid was $301, I would just take it out in the parking lot and hit it with my truck. Why? If you've watched some of my more recent videos, then you know that something that I like to do is take the time to respond to some of the more frequent questions that I get in the comments. And part of the reason that I like to do that is, I think... Honestly, YouTube is kind of a clunky platform when it comes to discussion. For example, I read pretty much every comment that I get, and I do respond to a lot of them, but it's pretty rare that the person who I respond to responds back, which is fine. And actually, if they did, I don't even get notified, so I guess all of this just illustrates the point that this isn't really what YouTube is set up for. It's kind of one-way communication. Also, as a quick aside, if you see somebody with my logo respond to your comment saying you've won some kind of contest, it's spam, so don't respond to that. Anyway, back to the comments. So I always figured that anything that anybody leaves a comment about, there's probably hundreds of people who've thought that same thing or had that same question, so I try to address some of them here. 
And something that I've noticed is that they tend to be disproportionately negative when in reality, by far the majority of comments are actually positive. Actually, probably the single most common comment that I get is somebody just saying they liked the piece being built in the video. Something like this. So thank you to everybody out there for all the comments, good and bad. And especially you, Scrody McBoogerballs. Anyway, to get back on track. You can see here that the top still has a bit of bow in it, but here's why I'm not concerned. So this is the design that I finally landed on. And I know it's hard to tell in this drawing, but the overall thickness of the top is a little bit over an inch, while the thickest and probably strongest part of the entire piece is this stretcher right here, which is about three inches wide. So the amount of force that it would take to bend that piece is a lot. I'm not gonna calculate it, but just trust me. Meanwhile, you just saw that the top could be flattened with one finger's worth of pressure. So the hope is that the stretcher is pretty much going to act like a giant call to pull and hold the top flat once we attach them. All right, for lumber, my total costs came out to $168.22. And this was actually a first for me ordering online from Woodworker Source. And this isn't a sponsorship, but I get asked a lot if you can order lumber online. And I always used to say, I don't know. And now I can say, yes. So... That'll save me like two words every time that question comes up. Although, then if I tell them where, I'm right back to where I started with three words. Not really sure what to do about that. But either way, before I could start cutting up any of the white oak, I did the same thing that I do in the beginning of pretty much every project, and that is creating myself some templates out of MDF to dial in my shapes. Now, this is one of those jobs that's a perfect candidate for a CNC. Obviously, a CNC is way more accurate than I can be with pencils, saws, and sanders, but I do have one secret weapon. So if we look back at the drawing, the two templates that I need are this leg shape and this stretcher shape. And for the most part, everything's pretty arbitrary. It just needs to look good to the eye. So one advantage of doing it by hand is that you get to see it take shape and adjust off of a real-world item instead of a drawing on a screen. And what would by far be the hardest part of making this template would be making the stretcher piece symmetrical. So what I did instead was just make half of the piece and then use that as a template to make another template on a larger piece of MDF. Basically the analog version of copy paste. Control C, Control V. 2000, but he's in Australia. He said the bid is in Australian dollars. But I don't, what does that mean? I think in Australia for dollars, they use kangaroo turds. Chris, 2,500. There's a higher bid. Where did that person live? They did not put a state, just an address. So let me do a quick little. It might be a scam. Googie. Indiana. I don't think that's even a real state. And since then, has anything beat the $2,500? Let me see. Now, something I haven't mentioned yet is whatever money I end up selling this piece for, we're going to donate to a local nonprofit that serves victims of domestic violence called the Women's and Children's Crisis Shelter. So I'm really hoping that we're able to raise a lot of money and we're able to help a lot of people. And now I'm going to ask for your help. Not for money, but just figuring something out. So design-wise, something I'm not doing with this table is giving these legs any kind of inward lean. And if you saw the desk project that we built a few months ago, you might remember that we did lean the legs in on that one. So in that video, I talked about how sometimes a weird optical illusion can happen when you make legs perfectly vertical, where they actually look like they're leaning in slightly at the bottom. So the reason that we'll often lean them out is to counteract that. And in the comments section, somebody said that what I was probably talking about was a concept called intasis. So I went down the Wikipedia rabbit hole and I think the idea is similar, but different. I guess in architecture, when people would use tapered columns, if the taper is straight, it creates an illusion where the column looks like it's thinner at the center. So to counteract that, they would make the column slightly bulge at the center. I might be explaining that wrong, but that was the basic idea from what I could gather. So my question is, does anybody know if there's a term that explains what I'm talking about with the leaning optical illusion? I poked around and couldn't really find anything, the only other mildly similar thing that I could find was the Ponzo illusion, but that's where we judge the size of objects based on their background. So why this box looks bigger than this one, even though they're the same. Anyway, if you're a know-it-all, 
this is your time to shine because I'm genuinely curious to find this out. All right, I want to take a minute to quickly thank EcoFlow for sponsoring this video. So they recently sent out their newest smart generator, and this is an upgrade from their old gas generator, and they call it the Smart Generator Dual Fuel because it can still be powered by gas just like the old one, but now it can also run off of liquefied petroleum gas, or LPG, hence the dual fuel. Now probably the biggest benefit of that is that LPG is cleaner, easier to use and maintain, and in the event of a disaster with both options combined, you've got more access to power. So this isn't my first time working with EcoFlow. A couple months ago, they sent out their Delta II power station, and I've been getting a ton of use out of it. I've been using it to power tools in my shop near my roll-up door where there isn't any power. Honestly, just because it's faster than running an extension cord every time. I've used it to do some work outside, and I even took it to my oldest son's school's fair to power a bounce house. So it's been really cool to have. And that's not the best part. What's really good is knowing that this thing will have me covered in case of an emergency or rolling blackouts, which are really common here in the summer. It can power all of my family's devices and our essential appliances. Now, the EcoFlow Smart Generator Dual Fuel is the smartest and most efficient power option, especially when you combine it as backup with the Delta II or one of EcoFlow's other portable power stations. It takes all of those benefits and takes them up to the next level. So with a standard 20 pound LPG tank generating up to 20 kilowatt hours connected to something like my Delta II, all being controlled and monitored from the EcoFlow app with things like auto start and stop enabled to make sure that I always have power and that I'm reducing fuel consumption, emission, and noise, I've got a worry-free, high capacity, smarter, more efficient, and more intuitive energy solution. So if you're in the market, they're running their biggest promo of the year for Black Friday with some products up to 50% off right now. So check out my links in the description below to find out more and take advantage of their best deals until November 28th. Thanks, EcoFlow. So far, making the base has been pretty straightforward. You saw me make myself some templates, and then it was just a long process of using those templates to replicate the shape out of actual wood. But things are gonna get a little bit trickier for the next couple steps. Well, actually not the very next step, because the very next thing is just putting a large radius on my sharp edges, which isn't very tricky at all. But then after that, we're gonna cut in our mortises for attaching the top and the base together. So I'm gonna quickly explain this with two types of visual aids, and then you let me know which one you like better after. So what I decided to do is drill an oversized hole all the way through my stretcher with an even more oversized mortise. That way a bolt and a washer can go through and secure the top to the base and still have a little bit of wiggle room. Okay, here it is again with a different visual aid. So what I decided to do is drill an oversized hole all the way through my stretcher with an even more oversized mortise. That way a bolt and a washer can go through and secure the top to the base and still have a little bit of wiggle room. All right, which one of those did you like more? Animation or drawing? For long time viewers, you'll remember that I used to explain everything through animations and then switched to drawings a couple months ago. Honestly, just because they're kind of more fun for me to make. That said, if one of them is clearly easier for people to understand, I'm pretty open, so let me know. Now, the next thing that we need to do is create our lower shelf and figure out how we're gonna attach that. So every so often I'll make a project where the stakes are really low and it's basically just an excuse to try out new techniques. And about a year ago, I built this weird kind of floating shelf thing. So on that, the main experimentation was really on the transparent foot. And I'll be the first to admit that this was a very goofy project. But while building it, I also messed around with doing shelves with a round edge that fit into a round groove. And that was actually my real takeaway from this project. I thought they looked cool. Kind of tricky to assemble, but yeah. So I figured this was a good time to implement that look into a real, not goofy project. And I went back and forth in my head several times on different ways to cut the grooves in my legs. And what I landed on was using my CNC. And this was not a decision that I took lightly because you've already witnessed firsthand my ability to screw up even the simplest of tasks. And here, if I really mess something up, it'll be not good because I've already got a lot of time invested in these legs. Thankfully, it all went great. 
Have you guys ever seen those advertisements where you get 16,000 woodworking plans for like 67 bucks or something like that? Well, I did the math, and that means that each plan would cost a little less than half a cent. And full disclosure, I've never seen those plans, so I can't really speak to their quality. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say, even at a half a cent per plan, I think you're probably overpaying. My personal belief is that with woodworking plans, you're really looking for quality over quantity. And maybe I'm crazy, but I figure if I'm going to spend hundreds of dollars in materials and dozens of hours of my time building something, I don't want it to be just one of 16,000 things. I want it to be the one thing that I really want and that I'll love. Now, obviously I'm biased, but I really do believe that our woodworking plans are the best out there. So maybe that was a hard sell, but I'm not trying to hard sell you. And instead, I'll just say, if you're looking to build something and you like plans, give ours a look and see if any of the pieces speak to you. And actually, just to clear up any confusion, we don't even call them plans anymore. We call them online project courses. And honestly, that's more what they're like. A course, but in the end, instead of getting a crappy certificate, you get a table or a desk or a chair or whatever piece you want. Okay, I'll shut up now. But I'll also throw a link in the description. And again, if you're interested, check them out. All right, the last time that you saw the top, you'll remember that it was bendy. But what you didn't see is that every time I thinned it out more, I was revealing more and more bug holes or wormholes. I can't remember. One of those two. So the good news is that I'm pretty much at maximum thinness here. So as long as I take care of all of these holes, we should be good. The bad news is there were some on the top, some on the edges, some on the ends. And thanks to gravity, you can only really get one face at a time. So this is kind of a slow process, getting one face, then waiting a few hours, doing the next, and so on. Then with all of that out of the way, I could give the top a quick sanding, and then any remaining problem areas are just going to get fixed with a little CA glue. And then from there, I can continue shaping the top by hand, getting rid of any of the caked on epoxy, and just making sure that I like the look of the shape. Okay, price check time. Our total costs ended up being $156.75 for the slab, I estimated $220 worth of epoxy, $168.22 for the white oak on the base, $19.56 in hardware, and I'm estimating about $25 in finish and other consumables, for a grand total of $589.53. Now, the top bid when we last checked, and there were a few days left in the auction, was $2,500 from a guy in Indiana. And in the final hours, nothing came in and beat that. Kind of. So, I called to get a shipping quote, and the cost of packing, shipping, insurance, and all that ended up being well over $500. Which means that the bid that ended up maximizing profit was actually the $2,000 bid from a guy named Scott. So... In between the days when the bid came in and when I contacted Scott to tell him he won, he had looked into the charity that we're raising money for, and he felt so moved that he actually increased his bid to $5,000. So that is what the Women's and Children's Crisis Shelter is getting. And I love it, and that makes me very happy. Thank you, Scott. Seriously. Now, the reason that I bothered keeping track of expenses was that earlier in the video, I said I would do it to see what the profits would be if this were just a normal sale. So in my opinion, you basically throw out the $5,000 bid in that scenario. And even shipping is kind of a weird one-time variable that's going to be different based on where you live and where the client lives. So I think to be fair, let's just go with the $2,500 bid. That's really the most that somebody was willing to pay. Which means that profit would be $1,910.47. Now, all that said, regardless of how you calculate it, my takeaway is going to be the same. From the point of view of the builder, this was a bad business move. Or not bad, but maybe not the smartest. So the slab was basically free because it was leftovers. That said, if I were to buy a slab to build this piece, instead of using what was far and away the hardest part of the slab to work with, I would have saved a ton of time. And I know it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. Time is money. Now it's hard to say exactly how much time because everything gets really cloudy when you're filming and editing video, but even without knowing exactly what the time difference would be, I can tell you that 
I value my time at more than whatever the cost of an easier to work with slab would have been. I think we have this very romanticized idea about the notion of nothing going to waste. And I get it. That's a great thing. You know, using every part of the buffalo and so on. But the reality is, if you use everything, at some point, you're going to eat the buffalo's... Chris. Let's just say it's not all wings. Thank you for watching. And thank you to everybody who bid. I'll see you in the next one.